Will you go to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, please? At this church, we love and devour the Word. You notice here, everybody brings their Bible. We tell people they don't come with their Bible, they're naked. You, you, this is your clothing right here. This is your garment. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Just leave it open to that chapter because that's where I'm going to be all morning. Speak to you this morning on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Don't forget the service is 3 o'clock. At 6 o'clock this afternoon, we have camp meeting all day here. All three different services. There are no repeat services. They're all uh, different services, so <clears throat> keep those in mind, if you will. The ministry of the Holy Spirit from 1 Corinthians 12, chapter. Heavenly Father, uh, I need you. I must have you because I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the Godhead. Oh, Jesus, what a sacred thing. And I pray you sanctify me and sanctify every word that goes out of my mouth. And, Lord, sanctify our ears. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. It is written, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. Speak, Lord. We need to know the ministry of the Holy Spirit so that in these last days with so much confusion we will not be carried away but we will be rooted and grounded with an understanding of the work the call and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Jesus name I pray Amen Now Paul makes it very clear that God does not want his children to be ignorant of the ministry of the Holy Spirit why the Holy Spirit came why he was given, and why he indwells these human bodies. Look at chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. He said it's absolutely important that you understand. I think it's very sad that today many people who are in what is called the charismatic movement, who boast about being baptized with the Holy Ghost, spirit-filled, Spirit-led, Spirit-directed. They, they have the theology of the Holy Spirit in a measure. They talk about the Holy Spirit, but they don't understand His ways. They don't understand His ministry. For if they understood the ministry of the Holy Spirit, there wouldn't be the abuses. You wouldn't have millions of charismatics running all over the world trying to find some new work, some great revival, some touch of God, they have not understood why the Holy Spirit has come. They don't understand his mission and his eternal purposes. And this is why we have so many abuses of the Holy Ghost today. This, this ignorance of the purpose and the reason God sent him. Now, the Holy Spirit we know to be the third person of the Trinity. He is of equal deity with God. Now get that. The Holy Spirit is equal deity with God. We can worship the Holy Spirit because He too is God. He is God. The Holy Spirit is of the same essence of God Himself. He is God, high and holy, and all through the generations, all past generations, up to this this last generation, the Holy Spirit was held in such high esteem. See, the Holy Spirit was there when the world was created, the Bible says. The Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. The Bible said the Holy Spirit moved upon holy men of God and they gave to us the Scriptures. This has all been the work of the Holy Spirit. And for centuries, the Holy Ghost was held in such dignity and such awe and such reverence. But you see, today... We have stripped the Holy Ghost often in many circles. We've stripped him his dignity. We have stripped him of the awe. And we've made him to be one just like ourselves. Mr. Buddy Buddy. He, he just another, well, uh, hi, Holy Ghost. Uh, you know, and, and it's almost as if he, he is here now, uh, not as creator God, not as the creator of all things. 
Not as he that is high and holy, who is God himself, but he's some kind of a cosmic genie who's here just to make sure that I'm comfortable and that I'm happy and that I'm joyful. And they have missed entirely the eternal purpose of the Holy Ghost and why he was sent. He is not your or my personal genie just to take our commandments and make us comfortable and happy here on earth. That is not the purpose and the call of the Holy Ghost. He's not an ordinary Joe. We have taken the Holy Ghost, the, the, the reverence and the awe and the respect. There were people who even mentioned his name in years gone by. There was such a holy reverence for the, the very name and the personality of the Holy Spirit. How that has changed. This is why we, it is so important to understand the ministry and the reason that God sent the Holy Ghost to the earth. Now, why is it so important? First of all, it's important because the sin against the Holy Ghost is the only sin mentioned in the Bible that is unpardonable. It cannot be, those who blaspheme the Holy Ghost cannot in this age or in any age be forgiven. The scripture says in Matthew 12, 32, Whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. God is showing us how important it is to know who he is and why he's here, so that we do not do despite to his name. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that those who did despite to the spirit of grace that there's nothing remaining for them but a certain fearful looking of judgment and fiery indignation which shall destroy the adversary. He said, you dare not do despite to the spirit of grace because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace. The scripture says there's coming a time of great delusion on the face of the earth and we are in that time of delusion when many, many uh, well-meaning Christians because they, they do not have an intimacy with Jesus they don't want to pay the price. They want to run around somewhere and get somebody to give them a word or lay hands on them and slay them and solve all their problems. And they don't want to go in the secret closet and seek his face. They don't want to pay the price to get to know who the Holy Ghost is. And so they're carried away, the Bible said in the last day, by winds and waves of doctrines. These winds and waves, the winds are going to sweep from the north and south and the east and west all kinds of new doctrines every one of them claiming to be the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible said many are going to be swept away and they're going to come into delusion. Does that not concern you, Christian, as you sit in this church, that it's possible and it's happening right now? Multitudes of well-meaning people are being carried away, swept away, and in delusion believing a lie to be the truth. Doesn't that concern you? It should concern every believer in this place today. It's impossible to understand the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit until you understand why God sent him, why he was given. Now, all false teaching about the Holy Ghost is a result of the ignorance of his purpose and his ministry. That's why we have all the abuses today. The Heavenly Father has provided two means by which he would redeem lost souls. Remember when Adam sinned, sin was passed upon all of the posterity of mankind, and God was not caught off guard. God had a plan, and there are two means by which God purposed to bring man back to himself and to redeem all of lost mankind. First, he would give his son. He would give his son Jesus to die for the world. And most Christians have a pretty fair concept. They have a pretty good doctrine about why Jesus came. Most of you in this building hearing me now, you know about the crucifixion. You know about the sacrifice of Jesus. You know that he died to justify us from our sins. And you're quite settled in that knowledge. It's, it, it's brought you to a, a, a major peace and rest. But you see, God had a two-part plan. First of all, he would send his own son. He would give his only son. Secondly, he would give the Holy Ghost. He would give the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, when he left this earth, said, I'm going to the Father, but another is coming. 
And he is going to finish my work, the work of redemption. Beloved, listen to me, please. The Holy Ghost was sent to make up for the absence of Jesus Christ on this earth to finish redemption, to finish calling lost mankind to the new world, to the kingdom of God. That is the purpose. That's why the Holy Ghost was sent. The Holy Ghost was sent to finish the work of redemption. And the Holy Ghost will never veer to the right or to the left. Everything he does centers on redemption. Everything has to, has, that he does has to do with the winning and the bringing back of lost souls. That's why he comes to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's why he was sent. I want you to go to John, the 14th chapter, if you will, please. The 14th chapter of John. Beloved, we're studying the Holy Ghost and his ministry this morning. It's so important that you and I understand it. John 14th chapter, beginning to read verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. See, the world out there doesn't know the Holy Spirit. They don't know anything about him. But you can't be in ignorance, the Bible says. You must know the Holy Spirit. You must know his workings. You must know what his purpose is. <clears throat> because it hath not seen him, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Look now down at verse 25 and 20 through 27. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Will you turn over now to John 16? Turn the page, John 16. Beginning to read at verse 5. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you ask me, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go away, the Comforter will not come. If I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. Of sin because they believe not in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. He shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. Beginning to tell you just a little bit about the call or the coming in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Notice it says, when he is come. He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, folks, that is his mission. Redemption. The winning of lost souls worldwide. China, India, Africa, Mozambique. Every country represented here. You heard all the countries represented here in Times Square Church this morning. The Holy Ghost has come to redeem the lost in your nation, in your country. All the lost in the United States, South America, and the whole world. All nations, all, t all tribes. The Bible says, you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me. Now, that's why the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost. That through us, the Holy Ghost has to use bodies. It doesn't use angels. The Holy Ghost is a spirit. He is a spirit. 
He has to use human form. He has to use human instruments. So the Holy Ghost came down to keep his eternal purpose. And he says, I'm going to fill you and you are going out and my spirit will flow in and through you to win the world, to win the lost, to witness. You shall be witnesses unto me. You are going to do the work. The Holy Spirit says, your body's going to become my temple. I'm going to live in you. I'm going to sanctify you. And I'm going to send you out into all the world, he says, to preach the gospel and make disciples. That is the word. Keep that in mind. If you keep that in mind, you will not make a mistake about his ministry and his works and his gifts. Because they all are focused on that eternal purpose of his coming. Beloved, I'm trying to make this very, very simple. Scripture says, How shall they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Do you know that every one of you here now are called to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I don't mean here, standing here. I don't mean a piece of paper that, that ordains you. Folks, that piece of paper is not worth much more than it's the cost of the paper. That doesn't make a preacher out of anybody. I know a lot of ordained preachers ought to be digging ditches. I, I say it lovingly. They're not called, but they have the paper. No, we're all called. We're to be baptized of the Holy Ghost to go out and win the lost. That is his eternal purpose. I believe the grief of the Holy Spirit in these last days goes beyond the abuses of the gifts. And all of his gifts, all nine gifts are being abused today. And beyond all the foolish barnyard yelping. That's not what grieves the Holy Spirit. It's not people sounding like chickens and lions. That's not what grieves the Holy Spirit. It's not the charismatic circus that we see in so many parts of the country today. It goes beyond representing the Holy Ghost as an entertainer who goes around tickling his children. He's not an entertainer. My God's not laughing at what's going on today. You know what the real grief of the Holy Spirit is? And what so many people are calling revival today and outpourings of the Holy Spirit? Now, thank God there are genuine outpourings. There are places where God is moving and working and souls are being saved. I mean genuine conversions. And where the true gospel is being preached. But much of what we see today is, is, is so far removed from the mission and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, they didn't stay in the upper room. God sent persecution to get them out of their church and to send them out all over the nations and around the world. But you see, the grief of the Holy Spirit is the apathy and the unconcern among those who claim to be full of the Holy Ghost, the apathy and unconcern for a lost, dying world. I tell you this, and I tell you weeping. If, if I were invited, they would invite me, but if I were ever invited to some of these so-called revivals where people are sitting around, just... Parlor games with the Holy Ghost, I call them. Just parlor games. Wanting a word, wanting somebody to knock them out, wanting some feeling, some manifestation in, in, in all of their laughing, in all of their noises, in all of their exalting, in, 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 in what is supposed to be moving the Holy Spirit. If they allowed me to get up for half an hour, and I talked about the dying orphans we're supporting in Mozambique, if I talked about all the drug addicts who are dying on the streets in Colombia where our Teen Challenge Center is, if I stood up there and told them about the dying masses in India and China and around the world and we ought to be on our face weeping and crying, oh God, Jesus is coming and this world is lost. I would get a cold reception and somebody would say, get him out of here. I heard one evangelist man was laying on the floor and he kicked him. He says, don't pray. This is not a prayer meeting. Get happy. And I, I see people watching this. Isn't that wonderful? And I, those who know Jesus are weeping over it. 
We're talking about the mission of the Holy Ghost. There are large churches today with thousands of members, multiplied millions of dollars spent on their plants with gymnasiums and all kinds of things, and I'm not against that. But folks, the problem is, there is no money for missions. There's no burden for missions. The young people are not being called to lay down the American lifestyle and go to countries like they used to. We used to send missionaries all over the world. Beloved, give me a church with all-night prayer meetings for the nations. Give me a church where this, there are hundreds going overseas for short-term missions. Give me a church where there are all-night prayer meetings. Give me two or three hundred people that are so absolved, so interested in missions, praying for missions, and seeking the face of God. Give me that kind of church. I'm talking about Times Square Church. That's what we have become. Hallelujah. We've got hundreds now. That's the kind of revival I want to see. I don't know how many I've already angered here this morning. The purpose is not to anger you. The purpose is to make you think and line up with the Scripture. Some would say, well, Brother Dave, doesn't the Bible say the Holy Ghost is our comforter? Is it not His ministry to lift us out of our despair? Hasn't He been sent to heal our wounded hearts and turn our mourning into laughter? Is He not here to make us rejoice and be glad as the Word commands us to? Beloved, He does that and He does even more. He sanctifies us, He purifies us, He guides us, He quickens us, He teaches us. But folks, all the comfort and all of the quickening, the sanctification, the edifying, He comes to edify. The, all the gifts are meant to edify the church. But why? Because he, He's not going to send His children out full of the Holy Ghost unless they have an experimental religion. It can't be a theology. It can't just be uh, some fuzzy thinking. It has to be something I have lived, I've experienced. I can't go out and tell the world the Holy Ghost has power if I've never been comforted by Him. I can't be a witness unless I've been edified. I'm not going to go out a sourpuss Christian without the comfort and the edification of the Holy Ghost. He gives these gifts to build up His church, build up His body, that they may be unshackled, powerful witnesses. Everything He does for us, all the gifts are meant not to make us happy. Yes, make us happy for one purpose. But you see, here's, here's just what happens. All of this comfort, for example, of the Holy Spirit. Why does He comfort us? Listen. Who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble, in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God, whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Who? To all those who are in trouble. The Holy Ghost says, I will comfort you. I will quicken you. I will bless you. I will bless you. Why does he do that? So that you can go out as a comfortable, blessed witness Saying, I know, I know, I know, because I've experienced it. There, <clears throat> wherever God sees uh, a city, a country where he's set on winning many souls, the, the Lord does this. I can't figure it. It's all in his sovereignty. But sometimes God sets himself like he did at Corinth. He, he, he told Paul, he told the church, I have many people in this city. And because he'd set his heart on the city of Corinth, he poured out all the nine gifts. All the nine gifts were operating in the church at Corinth. But the purpose was, the reason God so gifted the Corinthian church is because God said, I have many people in this city. His eye was on all those lost people. So he sent all these gifts. And there were nine gifts that are, are mentioned. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing. Working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. But you see what happened in the city of Corinth when God poured these out purposely to equip the saints to reach all those many people that God had his heart set on. Ambition, pride crept in. And they got so enamored with the gifts, they forgot why the giver was had come. 
why, why the Holy Ghost had been sent. They forgot all of those many people out and just came together and met to show off their gift. In fact, the 14th chapter of, of uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul's trying to correct the abuses. Everybody had to show off their gift of tongues, and interpretation. Everybody's prophesying to one another. And nobody was out there winning the lost. And so uh, there was a godly family there, the household of Clo, the scripture says. And the household of Clo saw disorder creeping into the church because here's what happens when people just sit around in church edifying one another with their gifts and pride and ambition comes in and people rise up and say, I'm an apostle, I am a prophet. Folks, they line up here almost every week. I have I have apostles come to me to correct me all the time. I have to turn and walk away. I say, you're no apostle because if you were the Holy Ghost, you wouldn't condemn me because I'm of Jesus. I, thus saith the Lord. How dangerous to say, thus saith the Lord, if God hasn't spoken. But you see, the church of Corinth was now in disorder. It was focused on manifestations and gifts. And they lost their burden for souls. And the household of Clo, seeing this disorder and saw quarreling, because people become inbred then and they begin to fight with one another. And someone's right, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos. And they, 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 they begin to taste sermons and they begin to judge sermons. That was a five, that was a ten. Uh huh. Paul was alarmed. Paul knew what was going to happen. They lifted up in pride now because of their gifts. And every time a guest would come, they had to show off their gift. Oh, God help us because they, they exercised the miracle gifts above all others. So that finally, even the Lord said there'll be many that will exercise these gifts. They'll be able to heal the sick and, 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 and cast out devils and do mighty things. And the Lord says, I don't even know them. They became so enamored of these gifts. They forgot those many others that were out there that God had his heart set on. Paul set out to show the Corinthian church and all believers that there is an absolute duty and responsibility of every believer to try the spirits. Try them. Test them to see if they're of God. And folks, you've got to listen to me and listen clearly. I want you to go to 1 John 4, please. 1 John 4. For the new believers, it's if you get to Peter, turn right, and it's just before Jude and Revelation. First John, fourth chapter. Nobody mad at me? Wouldn't matter anyhow. I'm not trying to be facetious, folks. I got a burdened heart. First John four, first three verses. Beloved, believe not every spirit. You know, that's, that's it. Think, think of that. Some people go to meetings, just believe everything. Because they say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And say the right words. But try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Did you hear that? Many. What kind of prophets? False prophets? The Lord said, there's going to be angels of light come. They're going to preach another Jesus. They'll have another spirit and another gospel. All the right words, but people who can't discern. Verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come even now, already, it is in the world. Now look at me. Oh, this is where we have missed it. This is where there's been such ignorance. Because people say, well, if, if I go and if, if I, I'll just go up to that pastor and say, is Jesus Christ, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? I say, of course he came in the flesh. 
You know, even the devil can get up and say, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That, that's not what it means. Just, just somebody confessing and using the words. No, no, no. What he's saying, do you believe that Jesus was the Christ and that he was also God? He was a man. He was God. He was God-man. Do you believe that he's right now in glory, not only as God, but man? He kept his manhood. He, we're still, he's still touched with the feelings of our infirmity. In glory right now, there's a man who has a hair, who has eyes, he has teeth, he has hands, he has legs. There's a man in glory. Now, I want you to, to, to listen. There's a testing of the spirits that you have to have. Your pastor can't do it. Your pastor can't trail along with you every meeting you go to and every time you turn on television. Well, I hope you don't have television, but you turn on your radio and, and you hear all of this stuff. You had better know. You don't have to have the gift to deserve it. All you have to do, we're going to, we're going to, going to show you what, what Paul was trying to say to the Corinthian church. Don't be fooled by those who go around saying, thus saith the Lord, or that Jesus is uh, Jesus has come in the flesh. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Remember the false prophets that stood before Ahab and Jehoshaphat? And they were prophesying, go up, go up, because false prophets always flatter people. Every word they get, you're going to be a great evangelist. You're, my, the doors are going to open. And, and if you're single, you're going to have a wonderful husband, a wonderful life. It's always peace, flattery. But the Bible says the true prophet, the true prophet shows people the difference between the holy and the profane. What is right and what is wrong, what is sin and not sin. That is the ministry of the true prophet and the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet that can come and give another word? And so they call Micaiah. And Micaiah prophesies a different message. He says, you're, you're going to be defeated on the battlefield and here comes the false prophet Zedekiah who had been saying, Thus saith the Lord, you're going to win a great victory. Now you know there was no victory. You know Ahab uh, was absolutely annihilated in Jehoshaphat. Ahab was in fact killed in that battlefield. And so Zedekiah, who said, Thus saith the Lord with his false prophecy, slapped Micaiah on the face. And then he said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord for me to speak to you? When did I lose the Holy Ghost and you picked him up? man lived less than a year. In Revelation 2.2, 2, Jesus paid a great compliment to the Ephesian church. Don't turn to it. Listen. He said, Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be liars. You know what Jesus is saying? He said, Thank God you weren't fooled by these people go around saying they're prophets and apostles, and you, you suspected something was wrong. You listened and you heard a word that didn't set right with you because the Holy Ghost is in you and you knew it didn't line up to the Word. You knew something was wrong. You felt it. You knew it. And thank God you knew they were liars and not prophets. And you called them what they were. They were liars. You were liars. I had a... I listened to a man preach in California once and I never saw such flesh, such stinking flesh in my life. Such abuse of the Holy Ghost. And his wife came to me after. And I said, I'm sorry. And I can't tell you what I had to tell her. The Lord won't let me tell you. But I just had to tell it straight and it proved to be right. Folks, there's evil. There is evil behind so much of this false work and moving of the Holy Spirit. There are men who are not righteous. He said, you knew it. And he complimented them. And Paul gave the Corinthians, and he's given us an infallible test of all ministries. And here's how you test. Here's how you test every ministry. Here's how I want you to test me. You test Brother Carter. I, I challenge you to test everyone who comes in this pulpit. Every time you hear the Word of God, here's a test. 
Listen very close. Before I go any further, let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is vitally interested that you get this because it has to do with his ministry. It has to do with, 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 with us walking in cooperation with the Holy Spirit and not opposing his work. So this you must understand. If you don't understand anything else of what I said, you must understand this now. Galatians, just listen, Galatians 1.8. But though we are any other angel from heaven, now that would have to be a fallen angel, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we've preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Now, here is the issue right now. Here is how you test. It's a doctrinal test. It has to do with what a man is saying. It has to do with what he's teaching and what he is preaching. Now, we have just read this. Hereby we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, I've told you that it's not just words. You can speak those words and not understand it. Let me tell you what it means. For example, the prosperity gospel. Let me tell you why I have been so incensed against this damnable doctrine of prosperity that's being preached. Because I knew where it was headed. I knew, I, I talked about it years ago, where it was going to head. And you know where it's head? It's head into the new age theory, the new age lie. You know what the new age lie is? We are all little gods. We are gods. We are little god. I, I was, in a motel once listening to a, on television to a California station and, and these well-known preachers were right there saying, uh, they were saying, you're a God, you're a God, and you're a God. <sighs> Do you know what that means? If Jesus was God and they claim to be a little God, they're claiming to be a little Jesus. And you know what that does? That's exactly what Paul the Apostle is trying to talk about right here now. They've taken away, they've stripped away the Godhood of Jesus Christ. That he's just another man and we're all like him. And he's a wonderful spirit, he's a wonderful prophet, he's a healer. But you see, he really wasn't God. We are all gods. The New Age Gospel says that the Spirit of Jesus is the God in all of us. It, it is, he's just a God spirit. So Jesus now is made a spirit, not a man, but just a spirit. And that's why they can say that Jesus, this man, had to go in hell and submit himself to the devil and win our eternal salvation in hell rather than the cross. And my Bible said it was impossible for death to hold him. Some of you have been listening to tapes. And you'd better throw them away. You better get them out of your house because it's a damnable doctrine. It takes away from the Godhood of Jesus Christ. It makes people be able to sweetly talk about Jesus being their Lord, talk about Lord, 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 and still in their heart not believe that He was God Almighty. Jesus cannot be broken in little pieces. That takes away from the sacrifice of the single. He said he's the only begotten son of the Father. The only begotten son. No other name. Can I tell you, leveling to your face, if you're into the prosperity gospel and you're believing this little God garbage, you believe that blasphemy, then you're the one who stands before the Lord um, they said, we did all these things, Lord. So I don't know you because you didn't know me. You didn't know me as God. You were God. You were your little God. Oh, God, help us. God, open our eyes. That's not the eternal purpose of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost has come to show that Jesus was God, that he died to save mankind, and you trust in the only begotten Son. And to, to make a million little gods, a million little, little Jesuses, on the face of the earth is to absolutely smatter the sacrifice of the cross. And the second thing that's happening now, and it's happening in two of the so-called major revivals now, a young man stands up and he says, the scripture is not the only revealed word. The new present revelation that's coming 
is just as important as the Bible. Listen to me, please. This is a lie that's going to sweep this nation and you get ready. You're, going to, you're hearing from this pulpit now. And I want everybody that calls Times Square Church your home, be ready and be prepared. They're, they're getting up now and be leaving. See what they do. There are many now who are in revival. And the pastors who once dug in and, and were in their closet for days seeking God and, 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 and studying and coming into the pulpit prepared. You know what's happening today? They, they call it winging it. You just get up and whatever comes, you just wing it and please ask the Holy Ghost to put it in your, your mind. God uses some exhorters in that way, but they get up now believing that everything that comes out of their mouth is a revelation. You know what that says? When, when they say that, that present revelation that men of, so-called men of God are getting to date, is to be trusted just as the scripture. That is to saying, that is saying that Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh. Let me tell you why. The Bible says in, in John, the first chapter, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And my Bible says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And when you say that any other revelation equals that, you're taking away the Godhead because this scripture, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. You can't separate this book from Christ. They're tearing Jesus out of the pages. That's what Paul's saying. Hallelujah. Beloved, you don't need a gift of, the, of discernment. There are gifts of discernment, but all you need to do is if, if you just wait long enough, you'll hear it. You'll hear a lot of things that sound right, that sound 95%, and then in comes this other. I have a revelation. I have something from God. If they can't back it up by the Scripture... It's a lie. It's borrowed from another man. It's borrowed from their dreams or it comes from the devil himself. Don't accept anything that doesn't come in total conforming with this holy scripture. This is our book. This is where I learn Jesus. This is where I get my faith. Hallelujah. Stay with the word. I'm going to close in just a minute. But let me tell you how you can know that the Holy Spirit's in you and in your temple and that He's doing His work His way. You see, there's nothing wrong with seeking the gifts. He said, seek earnestly the best gifts. God wants to gift His church. He wants all the gifts to be in operation. But He doesn't want to create a little bless me club where people around say, oh, Jesus, bless me. And everybody's waiting for a word. They want a blessing. They want somebody to bless me, my family. We're so, we're so interested now in our problems, our family, our little group. No, God says, if you'll get an eye for the whole world, I'll take care of your problems. You trust me, I'll see that all these things work out. But if, if you want to know the Holy Ghost is really at work in you, doing His work His way, you're going to find it easy to read His Word. You're going to find no preacher has to push you into it. You're going to have a thirst developed for this word. You're going to have a heart that's drawn into a secret closet of prayer where nobody has to bombard you with scriptures to convict you, to get you to pray because the Holy Ghost will begin to pray through you. We don't know how to pray, but when the Holy Ghost is working in you, the whole, if He's living in your temple, you'll, you'll find yourself talking to Him. Like I tell everybody in New York, you can talk to Jesus out loud anywhere in New York. Everybody's talking to themselves anyhow. I, I walk right down Broadway, thousands of people around saying, Hallelujah, Jesus, I love you, I glorify your name. Nobody turn, nobody looks. But when the Holy Ghost is at work in your heart, you'll find yourself beginning to pray for the lost. You'll begin to cry, oh God, give me a concern. 
And one of your great, wor- not worries, but one of your great concerns is, oh God, don't ever let me become so self-centered. Because when you become self-centered, you become a quarreler and a gossiper and a fighter. Nobody fights who has a burden for the lost. Nobody gossips who has a love for the lost. Doesn't happen. Hallelujah. Why has the Holy Ghost come? To finish the work of redemption. Hallelujah. God help us to bring the lost into this church. God help us to witness on the job. And everywhere we go, pray, oh, Holy Ghost. If this is going to be a Holy Ghost church, it's going to be a soul winning church. Hallelujah. I know four or five churches in this city that are, they don't talk much about the Holy Ghost, but they're sure full of the Holy Ghost because they are soul winning church. They are loving churches. They're everywhere witnessing. I bump into them everywhere. They're here and they're here from Times Square Church and others. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stand. Father, move now by your spirit. Go through this congregation and find every person, Lord, who has strayed from you. Every person, Lord, who's hurting and wounded. Everyone, Lord Jesus, who's been grieved in some way. They stand in this service this morning carrying grief. Maybe over sin, maybe over some lost hope, but oh God, find them now. Lord, I know that you have many people in this city, you're concerned about them. You have many people in this church this morning who need a miracle. They need their heart changed. They need to come back to their first love. Now while we're standing in his presence, I'm asking the Holy Ghost to speak directly to some individuals that are here, maybe for the first time. Maybe you've been here before. But you need, you need to make a decision. And you need to make that decision before you walk out of this church this morning. Whether or not you're going to go deeper in the Lord. I, I heard somebody say, recently you talked to somebody about the things of the Lord. And that person said, look, I'm satisfied where I'm at. I don't want to go any deeper. I don't want to go any further. There are some of you right now that are on the brink. You either have to go deeper in the Lord and go further with the Lord, or you, or you go back. And some of you are really not right with the Lord, and He's reaching to you right now. And some of you are running from your first love. You had a love for Jesus, but you're standing here in this church today cold. In fact, there's some of you, the message, you may have been touched a bit or amused, I don't know, but it didn't touch your heart. That's, that's the beginning of hardness, and that's so dangerous. And I'm asking you to shake that off. I mean, I would fight that if there was any hardness in me, if the word wasn't getting through to me, and if I sat here this morning bored, restless, I'd say, oh, God, have mercy on me. And I'd run. I'd run to God. And so, oh Lord, I don't want to get, I, I want to be tender. I want you to be able to move on my heart. There are a number here, up in the balcony, the main floor. You can't walk out the way you came in. You have to change because the Spirit of God has confronted you today. The Holy Spirit wants to heal your spirit. He wants to heal you. I want you to get out of your seat and come even now while I'm talking. I want to pray with you and believe Jesus for a miracle in your life. Up in the balcony, go to either side, down those stairs, and come down any aisle and meet with us here. There are going to be a lot of people coming. You won't be alone. The Holy Spirit's here to finish a work in so many, many hearts. Has the Holy Ghost been tugging at you and pulling at you? That's the time to obey Him. I believe there's a, there are a few husbands and wives need to walk down. A husband, you came with your wife today. It's your first time here. And Jesus wants you to settle it. He's been calling you. This is your day. Come and obey Him. Something I don't do very often, but I... I have to obey the Holy Spirit. I feel that there are three or four people here, and I don't know who you are or where you're at. And I'm not going to try to point anybody out because I don't know where you're at. The Holy Spirit's impressed this on my heart, that there are, there are three or four that are in a real battle here this morning. You're fighting a real battle. Don't let the enemy win that battle. The Holy Spirit in you win that battle. Don't come unless the Spirit's drawing you, but if the Spirit of the Lord is tugging or pulling at your heart, you obey Him. 
Because, you know, you know because the Holy Spirit tells you, he, he, he shows you the need that's in you. He shows you where you're wrong, and he does it because he wants, out of great love of God for you, the Lord's not mad at you that he says you can't persist in your sin, you can't stay where you're at. He's asking you to get off that mark, get off that line, and take a move. And sometimes that first move, then the victory comes. But please don't move unless the Spirit of God. It has to be the Spirit of the Lord, that tagging, that wooing, that precious wooing of the Holy Spirit. If it's tugging at your heart, oh, man, what a wonderful time to say, Jesus, I come. Talking, the Holy Spirit moves you at any time. You can come and join these that are standing. Those that are here, look this way for just a moment. All you that have come up here. <clears throat> How many of you that have come up here have never been at this altar before? You've never been up here before. Raise your hand, please. It's your first time to be up here. Raise your hand. Yes, yes. God bless. Quite a number. Lord bless you. All right. You can put your hands down. <clears throat> Let me talk to you for just a moment. Do you know why you came? That was the Holy Spirit. You can't be saved except by the Holy Spirit. You can't be convicted except by the Holy Spirit. And everything that's happened to you in the last 45 minutes is the work of the Holy Spirit. That means he's at work at you. It means he's here. He's not out there. He's right here in your heart. He's in there tugging. He's in there pooling. He's in there ready to reveal Jesus to your heart. That's the Holy Spirit. Isn't that wonderful? Some people think the only way you can know the Holy Ghost is on you is if he shakes your body. And You know, when you, when you look in the Old Testament, most of the shaking was done by demons. They would shake and lay them. And folks, I'm, I'm not decrying that. There, there are times, God bless you, I, I worked with Sister Catherine Cole for five years. I saw great numbers, hundreds of people just slain by the power of God. But I, I've also been in places where people think the only way the Holy Ghost can be judged as being upon them is to have jerked their bodies around. No, you see, the Holy Ghost, he, he can get you to dancing. But see, there's when the Holy Ghost does it, there's a rhythm to it. There's a wonderful rhythm to it, and it's a beautiful sight. But some of you that are here now, you say, well, Brother Dave, I just feel warm inside. I feel pretty good. I saw the Holy Ghost. That's the comforter. He's comforting you saying, I'm going to bring you through this. I'm going to bring you to Jesus. You're going to be forgiven. You're going to be set free. And God's going to, the Holy, set, the Holy Ghost is going to start guiding you and leading you in your life. Hallelujah. And he's going to do something else. He's not only going to solve your problem, he's going to make you a soul winner. He's going to give you a burden. That's the Holy Ghost work. I want you to lift your hands to the Lord. Just lift up your hands. And I want you to pray this prayer right out of your heart. Dear Jesus, I bring my sins to you and all my doubts and all my unbelief. And I say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Oh, Jesus, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit and convicting me of my sins. Now reveal the righteousness of Jesus to me and give me your heart and your burden for my family, my loved ones, and the lost. Fill me, Holy Spirit, with your desires and lead me and guide me and keep me from the wicked one. Now I'm going to pray for you while you have your hands raised. Jesus, I come now to the power and the wisdom and the might of the Holy Ghost. And I speak your word of faith into these hearts right now. Greater is he that is in you now than he that is in the world. Greater is he. Say this with me right. Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my body, my soul and spirit as a sacrifice. Use me, Jesus. And give me wisdom and a desire to reach other people and to win people to Jesus. Use me, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Use me, Jesus. Use me.
This is the conclusion of the message.